All right. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome in the name of the Lord as we consider the book of Joel together. I'd like us to read from chapter one, and we're going to read from verse five down to verse 14. And as we consider this portion, we're going to give it a, a very simple title. It's really a call to lament and repent. And so we'll just call it, uh, keep it short, lament and repent. So beginning in verse five, it says, awake ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste, and barked my fig tree, he hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers mourn. The field is wasted. The land mourneth for the corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up. The oil languisheth. Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen, howl, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree languisheth, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered, because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests. Howl, ye ministers of the altar, come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. Sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land unto the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord." And again, God will bless that reading uh, from his precious word to us. So really, it's a very uh, dramatic chapter. Uh, really, what we're seeing is the 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 impact of this uh, uh, locust invasion on different people in society. And so he, he divides it into four different groups and how they have been deeply affected as a result of this locust invasion. And so in verses five through seven, we're going to look at how it impacted the drunkards. Uh, we'll talk in verse eight through 10 about the city dwellers, people that lived in the city of Jerusalem, how they were affected. And then we'll think about the, the husbandmen or the farmers in verses 11 and 12. And then finally, we'll think about the priests who ministered at God's altar, how they were affected in verse 13 and 14. So we're going to see that kind of rippling effect through the whole of society, uh, the devastation of this locust invasion. And so we talked about this is a, a time to lament. It's a call to lament the, the great losses that they've experienced. And so we, we notice the, the piling up of descriptive terms that he uses. And so, for instance, for the drunkard, he tells him in verse five to awake and he says, ye drunkards and weep and howl. And, and so that's kind of uh, certainly strong emotions when you're weeping and howling. But that's what they're told to do uh, in, in the case of the city, city dwellers. Uh, verse eight, lament uh, like a virgin guarded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth and so calling to to, to lamentation to to again just a a, a dirge of, of of distress so to speak and and then as we move down to the farmers in verse 11 it says be ye ashamed o ye husbandmen how o ye vine dressers uh, and so again a uh, sense of shame because they've lost everything all all their hard work has come to nothing uh, the crops have been eaten, so they're, 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 they they feel the shame of it all and, and the deep shame and, and howling. And, and then finally, uh, the priests, well, they're told 
uh, to uh, do many, many things. Gird yourselves, lament, howl, come, lie all night, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather, cry. I mean, just a, a, a whole description of things that they should do as a response to the devastation of this locust invasion. And so it, it begins in verse 5 with this call to the drunkards. Uh, this unprecedented plague was nothing else but a, a, a display of God's judgment. And uh, we're going to see it's a har harbinger of dire, uh, and dire warning of judgment that is yet to come. Uh, and so it, it should move them to seek God and to pray. And, and so one of the things that we mentioned last time is that uh, a strange thing about the book of Joel is that there's no real mention of idolatry. So many of the prophets, their message was basically uh, calling out the idolatrous character of the people. And so the only actual sin that's mentioned in Joel is the sin of drunkenness, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. And so you wonder, well, why is that? Uh, and and so why was this locust invasion sent if, if there's no reference whatsoever to idolatry in the whole book. Uh, we, we have to determine what had gone wrong. What was the cause of this great disaster? And there's several suggestions that are made, but, but one that I think is perhaps the most satisfying is this. Perhaps the people living in a land that was known as a land flowing with milk and honey had become materially prosperous and as a result of their great prosperity, they had become spiritually complacent. They had kind of degenerated into a formality, a mere going through the motions. And so it might not have been overt idolatry uh, like the surrounding nations. Nothing of that is even suggested in the book of Joel, but this kind of self-centeredness that had settled in. They were enjoying, if you like, all the benefits of God's creation, and they weren't honoring and recognizing the creator who had given it to them. And it's very easy to do that. In fact, we, we, we could parallel it a little bit. I was just thinking about this uh, earlier today. If you look with me to 2 Timothy, just for a second, and 2 Timothy 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we read some interesting comments here, and I just want to read verses 1 and 2, and then down in verse 4, it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be, notice this, lovers of their own selves. The, the real idolatry is, is the idolatry of self, a narcissistic love of self. Uh, shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. And then look at verse four, traders, heady, high-minded. And this is the part I want you to see, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And perhaps the thought here is this, that in uh, the times that Joel wrote, the people were so basking in the prosperity that they had become lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Uh, they they become wrapped up in themselves and 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 just enjoying all the bounty of God's creation, but but ignoring the Creator. And so, certainly, if this was their sin, formality uh, rather than conventional idolatry or immorality, ex explains why the call the Lord calls on them, and we're going to see in chapter two, He's going to call on them for heartfelt, genuine repentance. Rend their hearts, not their garments. He wants reality. He wants them to have a real relationship, to abandon their hypocrisy, to abandon this idea of going through the motion like an empty ritualism that had seemed to have crept into the people of God, uh, an externalism, going through the motions, uh, and uh, uh, still acknowledging God, as it were, through the rituals, but really drawing near to him with their lips, but their hearts being far from him. And so uh, a plague, we might say, of spiritual locust had settled on their souls. 
And so it's a bit reminds me again, a bit like Laodicea, uh, Revelation 3.17. You're rich and increase with goods and in need of nothing. And that's kind of the, the smug complacency, self-centeredness. And what's required here, the Lord brings this plague to get their attention, to bring them back to uh, re- repentance. And so uh, he wants them to abandon the locus of formality and return to the Lord in true repentance. And so uh, if they would do that, the Lord promises he would remove the locus of the famine and he would restore uh, them the years of locusts had eaten. He would bless them. And so he wanted to see reality, real devotion to return to them, freshness and reality in their remembrance and worship of the Lord. And I, I do think it's a real challenge of living in a materialistic, prosperous society, right? We get caught up with all the blessings and it's so easy to neglect the blesser. <laughs> And uh, we we enjoy the comforts. We enjoy all his blessings. Now, what we notice here in the book of Joel, that the only sin we've said that is actually directly mentioned is drunkenness. And it's usually, again, that's uh, connected with uh, prosperity in a sense, lingering uh, long at the drink and all the rest of it. Uh, no idolatry mentioned, but, but just the, the drunkenness. But the Lord comes, he brings this, uh, this plague of locusts, and notice the language again in verse 5, it's almost as if the new wine was snatched away from their very mouths, almost like they've they've got the, the glass of new wine, and before they can even drink it, the Lord snatches it away from them. And so again, we read verse 5, Awake ye drunkards, and weep, and howl all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. So these people who had taken God and his blessings for granted, they'd degenerated into empty formalism. They were lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, symbolized by this lingering at the wine and all the rest of it. And so the locust plague comes along as a warning of greater judgment that was imminent unless they repented and returned to full fellowship with God. Now, I just want to take a moment because I I think it's necessary to do this because um, one of the things that I find very disturbing in the day we find ourselves in is the return of social drinking amongst the saints. When I was first saved back in 1981, I don't think I knew a single Christian, real Christian anywhere that drank. It was unheard of. Absolutely unheard of. Um, And that was in the United Kingdom. When I was last in the United Kingdom, I don't think there was a home that I went to hardly where I was not offered drink with my meal. I mean, alcoholic beverages. It just was a shock to my system, the change in just 40 years. And so, and and part of it maybe, uh, you know, how uh, people... Um, well, they maybe react against maybe a, what they consider to be a legalism, and they've gone to the other extreme and to a license when it comes to this kind of thing. And yet, uh, I just want to just take a moment to talk about what Scripture says about the dangers of wine, because I think we don't we don't realize how dangerous this is. And and again, coming from somebody who was a former drunkard. So I I know what I'm talking about here. This is not theoretical. (laughs) Uh, I've been there. I've done that. I've got to say this to my shame. I have the t-shirt. I know exactly what it is to be a drunkard. But, uh, and I know the dangers of this thing. So I just want to look at a few scriptures. Just want to take a minute, just just a little sidetrack because, well, well, not really, because it's talking, addressing the drunkards here. Ephesians 5, verse 18. uh, In fact, I was uh, preaching on this uh, on Sunday morning uh, in the adult Bible class on the subject of being filled with the Spirit. And, of course, it's hard to deal with that without dealing with the subject of being not drunk with wine. And so he says in, and I just want to break in in verse 17, he says, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding 
what the will of the Lord is. Right? This is very clear, right? We want to know what the will of the Lord is. And the will of the Lord, we've said this over and over again, is generally in Scripture is moral. It's not where you are, it's what you are. So you need to understand what the will of the Lord is. And what is the will of the Lord for the child of God? This is what it is. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. Now, again, I've often said the best way I've found not to be drunk with wine is not to drink wine. Every drunken always starts with one glass. (laughs) So me, it's the easiest way to, to make sure that I don't do that. Well, if I don't drink it, I won't get drunk. And he says, instead, he says, but be filled with the spirit. Oh, what a difference. Be filled with the spirit. Allow the spirit of God to fill your life and control your life rather than liquor controlling your life. And it does control your life. It controls everything. And and so be under the spirit's control. Now, look at the book of Proverbs. I want you just to see this. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1. He says this, wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Now, you don't notice that. Whoever's deceived thereby. And what what is the deception? The deception is thinking, I can handle this. (laughs) That's the deception. And it is deceiving because, uh, let me just say this. Let's look at the principle of first mention. I just want to take a minute to look at the principle of first mention. When is wine first mentioned in the Bible? Look at Genesis chapter 9. And I'm just going to throw this out uh, as a, a thought that maybe we could ponder. Genesis 9.32, it's the story of a man who is a hero. Let me see now. Um not 32, um, uh, verse 20, yeah, chapter 9, verse 20, it says, And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. (laughs) So, the deception is this. Wine is a mocker. You know, it said there's a deception. The deception is that you think you're a better man than Noah. If Noah, this this man who found grace in the eyes of the Lord, if Noah, this this great hero of the faith, and imagine this. So, I mean, he's a, he's a great hero. He stood out in his generation, and here he is, drunk and naked in his tent. Now, if you think you're a better man than Noah, you go ahead. That's all I can say. But I don't feel as confident that I'm a better man than Noah. So I'm just going to stay clear of it. That's the first mention. Let's look at another mention in Genesis, chapter 19. Genesis 19. Verse 32. This is one of the daughters of Lot, and this is what she says. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. And, of course, we know the story. It's not a pretty story, is it? Here's a man who commits incest twice with his daughters, and he was righteous Lot. How did a man who the scripture calls righteous lot, end up doing something so heinous as committing incest with his daughters. I'll tell you how he did it. They got him drunk. That's what what happened. So again, we, we just have to say, the scripture right at the very outset as he talks about it. Now, let me just talk about three positive mentions of wine in terms of usage in scripture, and then we'll we'll leave it alone. We'll we'll go from there. But I want you to again look at Genesis 14 and verse 18, where it's mentioned early in the scriptures. Genesis 14, verse 18, and it says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. So, Here's an interesting scripture, isn't it? Where the first time we have bread and wine mentioned together, connected with Melchizedek, a beautiful type of the Lord Jesus. And so let me say this. I think one place where a legitimate use of wine 
is the Memorial Cup <laughs> linked with bread and wine. And again, coming from a drunkard background, I've broken bread with real wine many times. It's never, ever been a temptation or a snare to me whatsoever. It's a different thing altogether. I'm there to remember the one who loved me and gave himself for me. And there's no thought of anything uh, risky in that as far as I'm concerned. So here's another one. First Timothy 5 and verse 23, another legitimate usage. First Timothy 5 verse 23 if we've got the memorial cup we have the medicine cabinet he says drink no longer water but notice what it says use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities and sometimes alcohol could be used in a medicinal way and after often the people would use it if you're coming down with a cold or whatever uh you know they would they would use um, hot whiskey and lemonade and whatever, that kind of thing. And I've been offered that kind of thing. The medicine cabinet. And, and certainly even that, you wonder today just because of the advance of medicine. And the reason I say that is certainly in the context of First Timothy, obviously Timothy had a dodgy stomach. And water is very risky. Even down here on this island uh, where I'm staying right now, we're not allowed to drink the water because you can get really sick. We we have to use bottled water. But in those days, they didn't have bottled water. <laughs> and so uh, wine was often used because of the dodginess of the water. But we could say for medicinal purposes, maybe there's a, a use. And now one more, Proverbs 31, verse 6. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 6. And the final usage. So we've got the memorial cup. We've got the medicine cabinet. And the mortuary candidate, that's how I'm going to label this. It says in 31 verse 16, um, Proverbs, I've got the right verse here. Verse 6, give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish and wine to those that be of heavy hearts. And so again, here's somebody who's ready to perish <laughs> and uh uh, maybe to dull the pain. Remember, the Lord Jesus was offered that when he was on the cross. He refused it, by the way, but he was offered it uh, to to dull the pain. And so, basically, I just just a, a little uh, sidetrack. Hopefully, not offensive to anybody, but I just want us to be conscious. I, I just I, I just so blown away of thinking about Noah. If Noah could fall <laughs> like he did, then. Who do I think I am to think that I can handle this? And that's the deception. We think we can handle it, but it's a very powerful, potent, potent thing. And so, again, my caution would be, be not drunk with wine where is excess, but instead be filled with the spirit, be under the control of a different spirit, the spirit of God. Let him control your life and do not bring yourself under the influence of, uh, of this potent force that has brought many a good man down. Now, notice verse 6, please. And so as he talks about the reasons uh, that these drunkards are to uh, howl and weep, and uh, it says, for a nation is come up, 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 come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath cheek teeth as a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste, barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare, cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. And so he's describing basically this uh, locust invasion. And we want to observe, first of all, the references in verse 6 to uh, the nation has come upon my land. Verse 7, he hath laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. And again, we just remind ourselves this land had been given to them by God. It was God's land. He, he allowed them to live there in trust. And, and so everything, all the blessings they had had come to them from God. 
It was his land. It was his fig tree. It was his vine. And and, and they should have re- reciprocated with deep gratitude and genuine worship because they had got so much from God. Uh, he, he had blessed them so immeasurably. And so um, they clearly had betrayed uh, his giving them these blessings by becoming cold and indifferent and going through the motions and just going through the the ritual, loving their pleasures more than loving God. And again, it's good to recognize, by the way, everything that we have, everything we have comes to us from God. Every blessing we have materially, it comes from God and, and it's given to us in trust. We came into this world with nothing. We're going out of this world with nothing. And everything we have in between, we're stewards of what God has given to us to use it for his glory. And and so uh, have we ever betrayed our trust and misused the Lord's possessions for our own selfish ends? That's the thought here. Uh, They had taken what God had given them and they were using it for their own selfish ends. So the land that suffered this invasion of unwelcome insect visitors who decimated the new growth of the season. And so they're described in three ways. First of all, they're described in their abundance. And that's why he says, a nation is come up upon my land. You see, an individual locust, it would be easily to, easy to crush it, <laughs> right? But this is not an individual locust. This is like a nation coming up against you. It's like a, a whole horde, a massive invasion, and so that's why he used it to describe the the, the multitudes of, of these locusts that he des- describes them as a nation. And so it describes them, first of all, in terms of their abundance. It then describes them in terms of their appetite. Uh, they, they, they laid my vine waste, it says in verse 7. They have barked it, uh, my fig tree, and have made it clean bare. And so they've got a voracious appetite. Nothing's been left behind. Even the very bark off the trees is being eaten. And so we've got something of their abundance. We have something of their appetite. And then the description that he uses gives us a sense of their aggression. Notice how he describes them. Whose teeth are like the teeth of a lion. Uh, Verse 6, he had cheek teeth like a great lion. And so you get this picture of like a lion's and it's it's like a prey that it, or that's going after a prey and it's aggressive. And so very clearly here, uh, this description is of a massive amount, a multitude of these things. Uh, they're, they've got a fierce appetite. They're incredibly aggressive and they're eating everything in their way. They're like a disciplined army on the march with lion-like ferocity and greedily devouring everything in sight. Now, the very fact that he talks in verse 7 about my vine and my fig tree, that that term, vine and fig tree, together, when they use together, usually speaks in terms of material prosperity and security. So let me give you uh, an example from Scripture, how the vine and the fig tree usually depict for us uh, both security and prosperity. So look at First Kings, and this is a description of Solomon's reign. And so, and of course, this is the first time I think this is used in this context. But it says in verse twenty-five of First Kings four, and Judah and Israel dwelt safely. Okay, so there's the security bit, and then it says this: every man under his vine and under his fig tree. From Dan, even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. And I I don't know why, I just get this picture of a guy swinging in a hammock, you know, kind of under his vine and his fig tree. He's got all this blessing uh, (laughs) from God, right? And he's secure. He's not worried. And and so there he is under his vine, under his fig tree. Now, again, just look look at a couple of other references uh, just further on from, from Joel into the book of Micah. And you'll notice in Micah chapter 4 and verse 4, just after the book of Jonah, Micah 4 verse 4, 
it says, but they shall sit. This is a promise of the restoration in the in, in the kingdom of Messiah. When a greater than Solomon comes and sets up his kingdom, it says, but they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. So again, God is once again going to restore to that nation. Hard for them to imagine that right now, I'm sure, with all that they're going through. But the promise is that when Messiah comes, he's going to bring them into days like they experienced under Solomon, where they'll enjoy perfect safety and security, and that every man will be under his vine and under his fig tree. One more reference in the Minor Prophets, Zechariah uh, chapter 3. Just before the book of Malachi, Zechariah 3, verse 10. And again, a promise of what's going to happen uh, as a result of him bringing forth his servant, the branch, the Messiah. Look at verse 8. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I'll bring forth my servant, the branch. As a result of the bringing forth of his servant, the branch, what's going to happen? Verse 10. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall you call every man his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. And so it's a beautiful picture, consistent picture of security and prosperity and blessing. And so the very thing that pictures security, prosperity and blessing as a result of this locust invasion has been taken away from them. Notice again, verse seven, he laid my vine waste, bark my fig tree, made it clean bare, cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. And so there's no shade provided anymore, no plenty. It's been exchanged for poverty. They find themselves in a bleak condition. And so Joel's message to the wine drinkers was really a wake-up call to to, to a spiritually careless nation It's time to awake to your true spiritual reality, your true spiritual state. Shake off the slumber and face the gravity of the times that they lived in and turn back to God. You see, it's very easy for us to become intoxicated by the spirit of the age and to become complacent. And maybe the Lord has to bring wake up calls into our lives to get us to repent and get close to the Lord again and put him in his rightful place. And so uh, I think it will be true to say, generally speaking, that most of us that are on this 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 meeting today, we live in a spiritual climate of apathy, spiritual apathy all around us. And it's very easy for us to become apathetic as we're surrounded by it, to become, as it were, intoxicated with the spirit of the age. And maybe the Lord needs to call us all to wake up (laughs) and to get real and to uh, to really uh, be to shake away the complacency that so grips many of our souls. Now we come to what we've described as the city dwellers. And there's a reason we've done this, even though the description is somewhat different. It says, lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. And so it's it's quite a, a sad picture, really, isn't it? That uh, uh, here's somebody who's a virgin. She's betrothed to, to her husband. And then all of a sudden, she loses him. And so you can imagine the devastation. And so she's in mourning. She's in sackcloth because the husband uh, of her youth has been taken from her. Now, why would we say this is speaking of the city uh, and at least the city and perhaps the whole of Judah? And that is because often in Scripture, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples, the, the city of Jerusalem is termed a virgin and so let me give you a couple of examples that are significant. Second Kings 19 and verse 21. Second Kings 19 verse 21. Second Kings 19, 21 says this. This is the word that the Lord hath spoken concerning him 
the virgin, the daughter of Zion, hath despised thee and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem hath shaken her head at thee. So again, the daughter, the virgin, the daughter of Zion hath despised thee, laugh thee to scorn, the daughter of Jerusalem. So again, there's Jerusalem or Zion termed as a virgin daughter. Let's look at another one, the book of Lamentation. Lamentations of Jeremiah chapter 1. Again, Judah's in view, as we know. Uh, Jeremiah is the prophet who foretold the downfall of Judah. Lamentation 1 verse 15, now it's finally happened. And he's lamenting it. With how fitting when we're dealing with lamentation here. It says in 1 verse 15, The Lord hath trodden underfoot all my mighty men in the midst of me, he hath called an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord hath trodden the virgin, the daughter of Judah, as in a winepress. So again, Judah, Jerusalem, all described in terms of a virgin. And so uh, these that, that live in Judah and live in Jerusalem, he says uh, to them to lament, just like we have in Lamentations chapter 1, verse 15. Mourn bitterly as a bride or bride-to-be would be mourn over the unexpected death of the man to whom she was betrothed or married. Like a virgin girded with sackcloth, lamenting the untimely death of a betrothed husband, they were called upon to mourn over the sins that had drawn down the judgment of God upon them. And again, it just gives a sense how deep would be the sorrow and the grief at the loss of of her betrothed or her beloved so young. And so, again, there should be this deep mourning, weeping over the loss of the vital religious experience in the land uh, through the, the devastation of this judgment. And so, verse 9 tells us that it's not just the drunkard that's affected here, but this locust plague is actually touching on the very house of God, the very worship of God. You see, so much of their worship was connected with a land being prosperous. They remember their offering to the Lord uh, of their substance in worship. And of course, now it's taken from them. And so it talks about the meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn. So now we're moving on in a sense, and we're thinking at least a little bit about the priests, but again, it's affecting Jerusalem, it's affecting Judah, it's affecting uh, this, uh, this land, because their very center of what made them a people was their worship. And so uh, there's greater issues at stake. Far worse uh, was what the locust plague meant to their to, not just to their social lives, but to their spiritual lives. The very worship of God was compromised. This should be an even deeper cause of grief. No doubt they were howling over losing their luxuries, but what about losing their, their relationship with the Lord, their, their relationship to the sanctuary? And so this locust invasion ought to at least cause them to feel this more keenly than anything else. The very sanctuary of the, of the Lord was being affected. And by the way, it's true, isn't it? When spiritual apathy is in the land, one of the places where it's first seen is the house of God. We've been to remembrance meetings where there's long, awkward silences, or people try to fill the silence but you, you, you can tell there's no real exercise, really. It's just kind of we got to do something to, to fill up the, 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 the vacuum of the silence. And, and it's very evident. And, and I remember once recently being in a meeting like that, and I, was, I, I just couldn't help but thinking out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And there were just these silences, not spiritual at all. It was like a spiritual poverty. And again, it's it, the house of God is greatly affected. And, and so the sanctuary of the Lord was being touched here. When God's people are in famished condition spiritually, 
And this is a quote from Mr. Ironside. I thought this was really good. He says, when God's people are in a famished condition, there's no real ap appreciation of Christ. Hence, the oblations cease to be offered. The meal offering sets forth the manhood of the Lord Jesus. The drink offering portrays his pouring out his soul unto death. But a spiritual famine doles the perception and sensibilities of those indebted to his one offering for all their blessing. So the gifts of worshiping people, of, of a worshiping people cease. And so again, when we are in days of complacency, one of the places that it touches is the very house of God. By the way, the implications of this is very serious because if there's nothing to offer for the Lord, do you remember what the priests lived on? Remember, their portion came from what was offered on the altar. So this is not just affecting the drunkard, it's affecting the very priests themselves. Their, their livelihood is at stake. And so he talks about verse 10, the field is wasted, the land mourneth, for the corn is wasted, the new wine is dried up, the oil languisheth. So these, these crops not only affected the lifestyle of the people, but they inter interrupted the worship of the temple as well. And because these, these commodities were all used, the corn was used in the meal offering, the wine in the drink offering, and then the oil. That was often used in connection with the meal offering. It was certainly used in terms of lighting up the sanctuary, wasn't it? So, so again, all of these, the, the lack of these things, they've been eaten away, is really affecting every area of the house of God. And all these things were essential ingredients in temple services. And so these three things, they... They're, they're the staples of the land, basically. And if you if you look back to Deuteronomy, there's a lot of references. We won't go through all of them. But these were the three staple products that were connected with the land. Deuteronomy 7, verse 13. Uh, we'll just read this one, but I'll give you other references you can look up in your own time. Uh, but it says, and he will love thee and bless thee and multiply thee. He will also bless the fruit of thy womb and the fruit of thy land. Then notice this, thy corn and thy wine and thine oil, the increase of thy kind, the flocks of thy sheep in the land which he swear unto thy fathers to give them. And so the three kind of main harvests of the, of the land that he refers to in terms of the blessing God would give them in this land of promise was the corn, the wine, and the oil. And you might want to look at Deuteronomy 11 verse 14, chapter 12, verse 17, chapter 14, verse 23, where, again, these three are always mentioned together in those verses, and they're represented, as it were, the staples of the land, the major forms of vegetation. From the grasses, the corn was the one that was offered. From the, the, the shrubs, again, uh, the, the, the offering uh, up uh, to the Lord uh, of uh, the new wine, and then the oil as well from the uh, the olive tree. And so these three were the main, as it were, uh, forms of vegetation. They'd now dr dried up. And so, <clears throat> again, it should, of course, be great concern to them that there's a lack of these things to offer in the house of God. And again, one of the things we ought to say is that what should concern us too it should concern us when the worship of the Lord has been affected by the spiritual poverty of our day. It should be a great exercise to us. It should be something that's prayed about at the prayer meeting. Lord, we don't want a spiritual dearth in the house of God. We want true worship to ascend to the one who is worthy. And so, uh, again, part of this idea of a day of... of um, Taking things for granted of, of going through the motions is that it has a chilling effect on the sanctuary of God. And so coldness and formality must be very, very grieving to the Lord 
And it's good just as we're entering into uh, the end of this week, getting ready for the first day of the week. May the Lord encourage us to come with hearts overflowing with appreciation of the person of Christ, whether it's the brothers in a, in a, in a public way or whether it's the sisters in silent worship or how we need hearts that are overflowing with love and appreciation for Christ. So he says in verse 11, he says, Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen, howl, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. And so again, they're called to howl and wail and to be ashamed. And again, just so humiliating for these these farmers. Um, they, they needed this. It, barley was the, uh, the the food of the poor, and, and even that was gone. There was nothing to feed their families. Starvation is staring them in the face. The situation is grave. The situation is urgent before them. The harvest of the field is perished, and how frustrating. All their labor is in vain. There's nothing to show for all their labor. The locusts have eaten it all up. And so he says in verse 12, the vine is dried up, the fig tree languisheth, the pomegranate tree, the palm trees, uh, also the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Five things mentioned here, all affected. The vine, the fig, the pomegranate, the palm, and the apple. In fact, as a result of all this, it says joy is withered away from the sons of men. Morale is at an all-time low amongst these people. All these harvests that usually the harvest time is always connected with joy. But when there's nothing to harvest, <laughs> the joy is gone. By the way, it's true to say, too, that because of our spiritual dearth, we're not seeing much of a harvest. The Lord said the harvest is plenteous. But the laborers are few, but we're not seeing much of a harvest, are we? Uh, many of our assemblies, when are we last seeing people saved and baptized and received into fellowship? What, what, where's the harvest? It seems that it's been eaten away. And of course, morale is low. Isn't there great joy when you see people saved and a baptism and all these things? It's a tremendous time of joy, isn't it? And the joy is withered away because they're not seeing anything. Uh, it, it's 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 like nothing's happening. All the labor, like the farmers, all the labor, but what's coming from it seems like nothing. These are things of great concern. And we, of course, should be deeply concerned about lack of fruit. Now, not just in terms of fruit, as we think of in terms of the gospel, but also fruit in the lives of the saints. So much emphasis in the word of God in, in abiding in the vine and the Lord wanting us to bear much fruit, right? And, and the husbandman often brings things, uh, as it were, to, to produce maximum fruit in our lives. And some of what he brings is chastening, it's discipline, it's so that we would be fully fruitful. And, and so these five that are mentioned, and, and th these are suggestions that I've, I've seen, uh, some of them are easier to see than others. But of course, uh, the vine. Uh, so he talks about these five things in verse 12. The vine would be representative of gladness uh, and, and certainly joyfulness. So uh, just look at the fruit of the vine in connection with that. Psalm 104. And verse 15, Psalm 104, verse 15, and wine that maketh glad the heart of man and oil to make his face shine and bread which strengthens a man's heart. So again, making glad the heart of man. And so again, when there's a lack of fruit, it affects our gladness, doesn't it? Where there, there's, a, there's a dullness amongst the people of God, a sadness because we're not seeing much evidence of God working. Uh, the fig tree would speak of sweetness. Uh, again, if we would look, uh, please, at the book of Judges, the book of Judges in chapter 9, where there's Jotham's parable. The book of Judges, chapter 9 and verse 11. 
where we read this, it says, But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forgo my sweetness and my good fruit and go be promoted over the trees? And so, again, there should be a sweetness, right, in our lives. Uh, we don't want to become sour old saints, right? Uh, Lord, deliver us from becoming spiritual curmudgeons, grumpy old men and women. We don't want that. Uh, we, we want a sweetness, just like the Savior. We're often saying majestic sweetness uh, that sits upon the Savior's brow. We need to go grow sweeter as the years go by. And, and again, there's nothing worse than sour saints. And, and so, again, uh, fig tree speaks of sweetness. The vine speaks of gladness. Uh, the pomegranate tree, now this is the one I had the hardest time with. There's lots of references to pomegranates, but speaks of freshness. I would think of it more in terms of, of potential. There's such potential in a pomegranate because it's full of seeds, right? And so, so again, in our lives, there, there ought to be this great potential for God to use, but some have suggested that it speaks of freshness as well. And, and so the pomegranate tree, the palm tree is an easier one, Psalm 92, and verse 12, it speaks of righteousness. And certainly uh, we're declared righteous, but we should see righteousness characterizing the lives of the saints. Psalm 92 and verse 12, it says, The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. And so again, uh, righteousness connected with that. And then the apple tree speaks of attractiveness from Song of Solomon chapter 2 and verse 3. Song of Solomon chapter 2 and verse 3, we read this. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. And so again, <laughs> his beloved uh, is the only one that stands out, right? Very attractive compared to all the other trees. And so, again, there should be this attractiveness about our lives. And so, again, if if there isn't, uh, if, if our lives are not filled with gladness and sweetness and freshness and righteousness and attractiveness, then there's something wrong. There's something not right. And, of course, there's a lack of joy when these things are absent. Joy is withered away from the sons of men. And so we reach verse 13 and 14. Our time is just about gone. But what is the solution to all of this? He really wants them to call a solemn assembly. It's kind of an interesting thing, isn't it? But in the early church, when there was a problem, there was a prayer meeting. There wasn't a committee set up. They weren't looking and seeing, well, these people seem to have a measure of success. What do we need to tweak or change? No, they came in the presence of God and they sought God with fasting and with weeping and with crying out to him. And sadly, we don't see that very often. In fact, what we see more often than that is a contentment with the status quo. We're just kind of used to this. We don't expect anything different. And there's not a willingness to come and cast ourselves before the Lord and say, Lord, will you turn our barrenness into a time of blessing? Do you remember how we started this book? This book is barrenness should lead to brokenness which ultimately leads to blessing. <laughs> you must go through the valley of brokenness if you want to enter into days of blessing and move away from days of barrenness. And so next time, in the will of the Lord, we will take a long, hard look at what a solemn assembly really looks like and why it's necessary in days of spiritual dearth, lack of fruitfulness, barrenness abounding, complacency, apathy, all of those are perfect conditions for a solemn assembly to seek God to turn the tide from barrenness to blessing. 
May God challenge us, stir us with these thoughts for his name's sake. Amen.